Hey everyone out there, glad to be back. So let's quickly go through what happened last chapter. So if you remember the crafty Odysseus, he disguised himself as a beggar and he stole the luck of Troy. Like he got himself into the Trojan camp or actually the city and uh, he stole their, their lucky stone. And they believe that that stone basically gave them like real good luck and everything for, for Troy, including these battles probably. Uh, while in the process, while he was before he stole it, he did meet up with Helen, and she kindly helped him along the way. So I thought I'd throw that in there as a as a little note. So let us just get right into this next chapter, which is called Warrior Women. So we've been hearing a lot of men fighting, but what's up with the women? Well, here we go. So here's the picture. Meanwhile. Paris was guiding the Amazons into Troy. The Amazons were a tribe of women warriors who lived far away in the lands watered by the river Thermodon. In battle, they were the equals of the strongest men, and some said that they were daughters of Ares, the god of war. Panthesilea, their young queen, had accidentally slain her sister Hippotale out hunting when a spear she had thrown at a deer struck her instead. And in her bitter sorrow, for she loved her sister deeply, Penthesilea could find no sweetness left in life and had no wish but to die also. But it must be gloriously and in battle. So she and the maidens of her bodyguard had left the forests and wide streams of their own country and come riding to join the defenders of Troy. Led by Paris, who knew better than anyone else that the forest tracks and the high hill passes, they reached the city without a blow struck on the way. Odysseus had kept his promise of silence to Helen of the Fair Cheeks, and so there was no band of Greeks waiting in ambush for their coming. So if you remember, Helen had accidentally let it slip out that Paris was out trying to get these Amazons. And Odysseus, I'm seem, seemingly being the virtuous guy that he is, he says, don't worry, I'm not going to say anything, which seems pretty cool. The people of Troy came swarming to greet them when they rode in, astonished to see them riding on horseback, which was the custom of their country, instead of driving in chariots in the usual way. They thronged about Penthesilea, who shone among her maidens like the moon among stars, tossing up spears in greeting, throwing flowers beneath her horse's hooves, kissing her feet. Wow. Priam held a great feast for her coming and gave her golden cups and fine embroidered garments and a sword with a silver hilt. If you remember, Priam is Hector's dad and Paris's dad. And she held up the sword and swore that with it she would slay Achilles. She, she pretty tough to say that, right? But when Andromache heard of the vow, she said within herself, Unhappy girl, if Hector could not do that thing, what chance have you? And the, pile, and the plied earth lies over Hector. Basically, she's thinking to herself, if you think you're going to kill this guy and my Hector couldn't kill him, you're in for a real surprise. Next morning, Penthesilea rose from sleep and put on her bright armor, her new sword at her side, and she took her spears and her strong shield and mounted her white war host. And with her 12 maidens beside her and Hector's brothers and kindred, or kind of like family, she set herself at the head of the Trojan war host and rode out wind swift toward the Greek camp and the black ships on the distant shoreline. And the Greeks, seeing her come as they drew up their own battle lines, asked each other, Who is this that leads the Trojans as Hector used to lead them? Surely it is some god who rides at the head of the charioteers. I mean, to see some woman at the front of this, this arm, like all these people, it's got to be like, what is going on? They're thinking she's like a goddess or something. So the plain of Troy ran red as though with poppies, as it had done so many times before. So now the battling's back with a lot of blood. And the warrior maidens took a heavy toll of the best and bravest of the Greeks. But before the sun was past its height, half of them lay slain, so half of the women were dead. And then grief and rage came upon their queen. She hurled herself upon the chariots, mad to avenge her bodyguard, driving the warriors as a lioness drives cattle among the hills, and shouting as she rode, this is the day you pay for the sorrows of Priam, Diomedes, Achilles, Ajax, you who men say are the bravest of your breed. Come out now to meet my spears. Again and again, she charged at the head of Priam's household, the few who remained of her bodyguards still about her, and the chariots that followed her lurching and rocking over the bodies of the slain. 
Like a lightning flash among storm clouds she went, now here, now there, and the Greeks were yet again hurled back across their ditch. And men were among them with firebrands to burn the black ships as on the day of the battle rage of Hector. Achilles and Ajax had not heard the start of the fighting, for they had been away from the camp on a raid of their own. But, returning just as Penthesilea and the Trojans crossed the ditch, they flung themselves into the struggle to drive them back from the ships. Ajax paid no heed to the Amazons, but rushed upon the men of Troy, while Achilles charged against Penthesilea and slew the last five maidens of her bodyguard. And she, seeing her dearest maidens dead, rode straight for the two Greek champions. Man, what is going to happen? She flung her spear at Achilles, but it fell back blunted from his great shield. She flung a second at Ajax, crying, I am the daughter of the god of war. Feel now my spear. But his armor also withstood her spear point, and he and Achilles laughed out loud. And laughing still, Achilles raised the great spear that none but he could handle. And even as her hand flew to her sword hilt, so she's going to grab her sword, he drove it down through the worked bronze and deep into her breast, so that the red blood fountained as he dragged out the blade. Yikes. Then, with shortened spear, he stabbed her white horse, so that both came down together, dying in the same fall. Yikes. Penthesilea lay in the churned dust like a young poplar tree that the wind had overthrown. Her helmet had fallen off, and the Greeks who had gathered around marveled to see her so young and so fair to look upon, with her bright hair spilled about her. And the heart of Achilles, who had killed her with her, was pierced with grief and pity, and he wept over her now that she was dead. It was kind of like in battle, you get raged up and they're fighting one another, but when her helmet comes off, he sees her and he's just very, very sad. The Greeks, in pity also, did not go after the Trojans, who were again falling back, nor did they strip the armor from the queen and her spear maidens, but laid them each on a bier and sent them back in, pre in peace to Priam. And Priam, who last night had made a feast for them, had their bodies burned on a tall pyre and their ashes put into golden caskets, and buried them in the grave mound of one of Troy's long dead kings. And I'll put up a small picture for you guys. It seems to be just a little bit of dirt that may be there. And that's actually it for this chapter. So it's a little bit intense and sad altogether. So what do you think? So why, why do you think Achilles would kill a person and then afterwards, you know, cry over her. Like that seems, that seems kind of strange. Like you just killed somebody. Uh, so what do you think about that? And the next one, what I want you to do is maybe try to be Achilles crying over uh, this dead woman um, in front of him or this dead young woman. So how are you feeling uh, after that? So I'll put my face there. All right, that is it for today. Oh, it's a real short one. Wow. But um, next week, actually, I am not going to give you the title of this chapter because it's going to have to be a surprise. So um, I will see you guys soon. Thanks for hopping on and uh, adios for now.